Hi, this is Grandma here, and I am reading from It's a Jungle Out There, and we're going to start with Chapter 4, Tempia. And here's a picture of the two boys, Terry and Ronnie. And of course, Ron, Ronnie is really the author of the book, Ron Snell. Um, and again, I'm going to remind you that I don't speak Spanish and I don't speak much Ginga. I speak other languages, but not those. <clears throat> Our first tribal home looked, felt, and smelled like the inside of a rattan basket. The floor, two feet off the ground, bounced when we walked. There were cracks between the slats of the rough walls. The palm leaf roof was neatly interlaced and tied. For the rest of my life, the smell of fresh cut palm leaves and split palm trunks would remind me of a new home. Our floor bounced because it was made of pona. Pona comes from a special kind of palm tree with a trunk about 14 inches in diameter. The outside of the trunk is tough as nails, actually tougher than nails if you've ever tried to pound one into it. The inside is a fibrous, spongy kind of stuff that's pretty easy to clean out. To make a floor, the machigingas chop down a pona palm and cut the trunk into sections about eight feet long. Longer segments would have been more convenient, but they weighed tons. Carrying them to a canoe and then from the canoe up the bank to the house was crunching hard work. Now, just having chunks of trunks for a floor wouldn't be all that comfortable. So the next step, step was to make a full length cut down one side, sort of, sort of like cutting a hollow cardboard tube lengthwise. Of course, a cardboard tube is easier to flatten than a tree trunk. The only way to get the trunk to flatten was to make hundreds of slits into it until it was so splintered it would roll out like the cover of a roll top desk. This produced hard, rough, flat floors with lots of cracks in them, which saved us a lot of sweeping. Of course, little kids could crawl under the floor and get a view of our lives from the bottom up, but oh well. So, how do you like your new home? Dad proudly asked his bride. He didn't carry her across the threshold. If he had, the Machigingas would have still be talking about this woman who couldn't even get onto the porch of her own house. It's beautiful, Mama answered breathlessly. The view was breathtaking, but remember she had also just survived her climb up the bank from the river. The Machis went out of their way to be helpful to help to us once they had recovered from the initial shock of seeing so much sickly white skin. The women kept us well supplied with bananas and fresh, fresh manioc. <clears throat> Victor, the headman of the community, made sure that the men regularly brought us fish and wild game. All day, each day, visitors came to sit on the porch and watch us or to pick and eat lice out of each other's hair while they passed the time of day. Have you ever seen that at the zoo? I've seen um, uh, apes pick lice out of one another's hair and eat it, but I've never seen people do that. To survive, everyone but me had to learn the language. I could already get anything I needed by bawling and banging my head on the floor, something my dad took care of later on. Here, he said, you wanna bang your head on the floor? Let me help you. Nowadays, I suppose he'd be arrested for using that approach, but it worked and he only had to do it once. Terry started picking up Machiganga along with English and Spanish that Don Juan taught him. He frequently came home saying things dad and mom still couldn't understand, fortunately. For dad and mom, learning Machiganga was one of the most exciting and brain-busting things they would ever do. They worked at it from dawn to dusk. During the day, they didn't have much time for anything formal, but they could both entertain guests 
and get language data by leaping, sitting, standing, laughing, crying, spitting, and carrying on their weird lives on the front porch. They faithfully wrote down what people said when they did funny things, even if they weren't sure what it all meant. Like when Dad jumped up and down on the porch. Tata Gakare, the Michigangas asked each other, wondering what had gotten a hold of him. Quick, Betty, write it down. Tata Gakare means he's jumping. It didn't. But how were they to know? They sorted it out after making fools of themselves a few times. Mostly during the day, Mom and Dad had to carry water from the little stream beside our house, hunt for firewood, cook over a kerosene stove, boil drinking water, wash diapers, hand out medicine, sometimes pushing it down the throats of screaming, thrashing kids who would rather have died than swallow crystoids and Epsom salts to kill their worms. In the evenings after Terry and I had been tucked into our screen cribs and the Indians had gone home, they studied notebooks full of new words and analyzed the grammar by the light of a gasoline lantern. Ever so slowly, words and phrases started to make sense. Mom's brain is magnetic. Her just once, words stuck. Her first complete phrase practiced on Terry and me was Gara Piati Anta. She learned it by listening to Machiginga legend and now she could fluently say it to us, don't go over there. Don't go over there. Don't go over there all day long. If it hadn't been for dad, we wouldn't ever have gotten to go anywhere. His first phrase was probably something like, sure, go wherever you like, and don't blame me if you get killed. For many months, the outwardly helpful Machigingas were inwardly suspicious of our motives for being there. Families from upriver frequently visited us, but they kept their distance. The only outsiders they had known came to take advantage of them. Men with several wives were still afraid that dad, who was stuck with just one, would try to take their extras, or at least take advantage of them. Women thought we'd steal their children for slaves. Everyone figured it was only a matter of time until we made them work for us. That was one of the reasons why my folks did all their own chores in the early days. That and the fact that the Manchagingas didn't know how to wash clothes, cook on a stove, or change diapers. They may have been afraid of us, but it didn't take long for the word to get out that our house was full of magic, and they were welcome to explore it to their heart's content. Our kerosene refrigerator used a flame at the bottom to make ice at the top. In the mornings, we talked into a box on the shelf and an invisible midget talk back. What do you think they're talking about? Talk into a box on the shelf and an invisible midget talk back. I think that's a telephone. Our special needles and potions cured something from hookworm to malaria. Besides our great magic, two things helped break down their suspicions. The first was we were a complete family with children, just like theirs. And we obviously wanted to learn to talk to them in Machiginga, even if it was taking an unbelievably long time to learn it. Their own babies learned it faster. The Machis laughed at us endlessly, knowing we couldn't understand what they were saying. Eventually, Dad and Mom got even. One day, early on, they left their tape recorder running on the front porch while their visitors laughed and joked. Months later, they played the tape back for the same Machis, who realized that they'd been caught, so to speak, with their robes down. The second icebreaker was that Dad and Mom tried to return the Machis' kindness in practical ways. Mom made dresses, including one from feed sacks for Victor's wife, and cooked fudge and popcorn for parties. Dad became the local gunsmith, making firing pins from nails and cleaning corrosion off roast, 
rusted shotguns. Machiginga men thought he, he was the best thing since steel knives. He also became the village barber, cutting jagged crew cuts that made everyone look like Navy, Navy recruits. It was a great place to be amateur seamstresses, barbers, and entertainers. The Machis appreciated every little gesture and wore their hacked hair and somewhat improvised new clothes with obvious pride. Since more than half of the tribe's babies died as infants and life expectancy was less than 40 years, medical magic also had a lot of appeal, at least after everything else had failed. Even though my folks' medical training was minimal, sometimes a shot in the dark was just the right treatment. For more difficult cases, they could use the two-way radio to consult Dr. Eichenberger, SIL's resident physician at Yarena Kocha, where very special cases, they called a plane to fly patients to Yarena Kocha. Of course, the medical efforts weren't always terribly successful. When dad got back from his first trip in response to a re request for urgent help, he wasn't very upbeat. He'd taken off in a canoe with a couple of Indians and traveled three hours upriver. Along the way, the canoe turned over and he was uh, thrown into the flooded Yorubamba with a notebook of language data. He and the notebook went in different directions. Having gone as far as the canoe could go, Dad and his companions walked barefoot up a stream, crossing it 15 times in water up to their waist. They found two people sick with malaria, but it could only say that someone would have to come down for medicine as his was spoiled when the canoe turned over. When Dad got home from that little excursion, Terry had a fever and I had a rash that looked something like measles. Mom told the head man about it and most of the villagers fled in a panic, dreading the possibility of an epidemic. It turned out not to be measles, but we were left to our own devices for a while since our radio had just quit working and we had no contact with Yarana uh, Kocha. They didn't have a real telephone. What they had was a radio, a two-way radio to talk back and forth, which technically is like a telephone, but um, it didn't need wires to send voices. It was done through radio waves. Many of our new friends died of simple diseases like the flu. Others depressed because of inconsolable grief, hopeless marital problems, or illegitimate pregnancies committed suicide by drinking the juice of a poisonous root. In the village of Pangoa, just upriver from Tempia, 11 people killed themselves during our first year with the Michigangas. Our man who lived up the Tempia from us brought his son down on a balsa raft soon after we got there. Dad and mom examined him right where he sat on the raft and found an advanced case of tuberculosis with open running sores on the boy's neck. They couldn't even tell him that they could help him. They had no medicine for tuberculosis. The boy was obviously extremely sick and his father didn't want his son to die close to where other people lived. Dad and mom watched in frustrated, mute helplessness as the father pushed the raft off into the current with the boy still on it, hoping that he would be carried a long way down river before falling into the water to drown. After all, the farther away he died, the less likely it would be that his soul would come at back up river to grab others to take with him. Years later, as I write this story, tears run down my cheeks. I see that little boy sitting all alone in a tippy raft, trembling and wide-eyed, trying to turn for a last look at his father who had just pushed him away. He was too sick even to cry. Although I don't even remember him, I cry for him now. 
When our friend Rosa's little girl died in our house, we heard the heartbreaking wail of a woman in despair. We kept the body overnight. In the morning, Rosa arrived back at our house wearing the red bandana. She had cut off all her hair so that her daughter's soul couldn't grab her and take her along to the place of the dead. Dad went with her to bury the little body. Michigangas dread the dead so much that a woman usually has to bury her own husband or children without help. Months washed past as rainy season approached. The rivers got higher and browner, the trails slicker, the nights cooler. Thunderous downpours streamed off our thatched roof. Sandbars and rocky beaches drowned. Everything we owned turned green. Chicken, chickens got crabby. Ducks got slap happy. In September, I'd had my first birthday, complete with Don Juan, one candle and four balloons. Now, so soon, Christmas was coming. It was about time to wrap up our first six months in Tempia and go back to Yaranakacha for a while. Our clothes were wearing out. Food was running out. Energy was draining out. About all we had left in abundance was milk and oatmeal. In Yaranakacha, we could regroup and dad and mom would work intensely on their linguistic data. One morning, dad started the generator that powered our, re our repaired radio and called the operator at Yaranakacha. The news that came our direction wasn't what we expected. Wayne, we've got some problems with the Aranaka, Aranaka that's the uh, airplane. Looks like we're going to have to send the engine to the U.S. for repairs. How copy? Over. Roger, Yarina. What's your best guess as to how long that will take? Over. The Aranaka was the only plane that could land near Tempia. Well, we're working on it as fast as we can, but it's going to take a while. Are you going to be okay out there? Over. We'll manage. We've got the essentials and the machis are taking good care of us. Over. Our prayers are with you all. Say hi to Betty and the boys. Over and out. We settled in for the duration, however long that might be. The first order of business was to figure out how to celebrate Christmas without cards, mail, decorations, presents from the outside world. Kind of the way Mary and Joseph did it. There were still some flower sacks left over from Victor's wife's dress with a cute floral print on them. In addition, Mom had brought some crochet thread. That was enough for starters. Dad unleashed the sewing machine and started cranking. Mom got out her crochet, crochet needles, asked for cotton from her neighbors, and went to work. By the time Christmas arrived, Terry and I each had a flowery, flower sack suit from dad and a freshly crocheted cotton stuffed toy animal from mom. I wish I could remember it. It sounds like what Christmas should be. We even had a Christmas party in the Mashaganga's big communal house, which looked like a huge furry cocoon. It was a long oval with dirt floor and stubby three foot walls with no windows. Almost no light or fresh air could filter through. The only opening was a door on one side. In the mornings and evenings, smoke from cook fires seeped through the thatch and the cracks in the wall, giving the whole house a bluish tint. Inside their house, it was so dark that we could hardly move around without tripping over something. Cook fire smoke filled the house leaving a shiny coating of black tar on everything. It was one big room with separate sleeping platforms for some of the occupants. Hand-carved wooden cooking utensils, bows and arrows, backstrap looms, and other necessities were stuck in the vines that held the thatch on. Water gourds sat beside the cook fires, 
along with the thorny roots used to grate manioc. On the fires, boiling meats, bananas or manioc simmered in clay pots with banana leaf lids. Above the fires, blackened meat and leftovers smoked on vine racks suspended from the ceiling. Victor, his two wives, and all their children lived together in that one house, along with a few other Indians. It was one big happy family. If you happen to be the favorite wife and healthy. For the others, it could be pretty miserable. With light from our gas lantern, the house was bright enough for the Christmas party, complete with homemade pinata, popcorn, candy, and games. The Machigingas weren't too sure about games like pin the tail on the taper, but the refreshments were a big hit. All in all, it was a great time, except that they couldn't figure out why we were doing it. Dad and Mom didn't know yet how to tell them what Christmas was. During our extended time, we learned to live and love in new ways. The Machigingas were a fun people. They hid behind trees to jump out and scare us. They laughed at and with us. They carried Terry and me on fishing expeditions and on outings to their gardens. They teased each other mercilessly and considered anger one of the worst sins. We enjoyed being with them. They were also a fearful people who couldn't enjoy a lot of the beauty around them. They didn't dare look at a stunning sunset or double rainbows for fear of getting diarrhea or being bitten by a snake. Army ants would march off with their children's souls, they feared. Eating deer would make them turn into one when they died. While we could sit on a mat and watch a lunar eclipse in a crystal clear sky, they erupted in total panic. After all, if the moon were to die, then the manioc the moon had supposedly given them would also disappear and they would starve to death. The beautiful jungle that we loved and enjoyed was often dreadful to them filled with spirits that were just waiting to make them sick or kill them. If an invisible being tricked them into having sexual intercourse with it, death was inevitable. They ran from things we never saw. My parents, of course, had their own fears. Dad was never inclined to stay in one place for very long, so he made trips here and there during our stay in Tempia. When he left, Mom put our folding table across the doorless doorway to the bedroom and stood a shotgun by her mosquito net. Fortunately, she was never threatened by wild animals or intruders. Given her total lack of experience with guns of any kind, she would undoubtedly have demolished all of our equipment. Herself and both of her kids before she ever hit what was coming through the doorway. In the end, it took three months to get the Aaron Anka engine fixed and installed. The milk and oatmeal never ran out and the Indians kept us supplied with food, including enough green squash to make everyone grow up hating it, which I did. <clears throat> By the time we got back to Yaran Anka, Akacha, we had been with the Mashagingas for nine months straight, and white people looked as strange to us as we had to the Machis. Just returning to our little center was a total shock. We got off the plane late in the afternoon, walked directly to the group dining room for supper with our friends. Uncle Cam asked us to stand up as he welcomed us back to Yarina. Then he got a twinkle in his eye. Now you see why we don't want teams to be out in the village for more than six months, he laughed. Apparently, we looked and smelled and acted like Machigingas, which is just what we wanted. Okay, that's the end of chapter four. Chapter five is going to be Midnight Matso and the Menagerie. And we have a picture of what looks like a wild cactus of some sort. So, 
that will be our next reading. Bye-bye.